Welcome to the first edition of the Asiri Designs Q&A. I'm Sharif Asiri, and I'll be answering some of the questions that you've left for me in the comments. This Q&A will mostly be about the nuances of vapor retarders and vapor barriers, as many of the questions and comments that I receive are about this topic. So let's get started. So the first question that we have is in regard to double wall systems. The question is, if you're going to apply an adhesive or liquid WRB to the exterior wall anyways, then why not use ZIP system? Is the permeability of plywood versus OSB really that much of a factor? And the answer is yes. Uh, while ZIP system is a fantastic uh, system that can be applied to many different climates and many different wall assemblies, um, the vapor permeability of that zip sheathing is a major factor in double wall assemblies because we're dealing with such super insulated walls. And so we need to be able to dry through that sheathing as best as possible. The problem with OSB products is that they are generally between two to four perms, uh, dry cup and wet cup, which means that when they're wet, they don't increase in permeability or permeance, whereas plywood actually can become up to seven times more permeable than OSB. Uh, there are times when we're insulating um, beyond R60 and, and super, super insulated assemblies uh, where we even need to switch to a gypsum sheathing like dense glass gold because the permeability of that plywood is no longer sufficient. We need um, something even greater uh, to facilitate drying. Uh, we need to make sure that the WRB is more permeable than the sheathing that it's installed on in order to make sure that we're able to dry through that, that WRB product. Um, that's really important if we're using fluid applied coatings. It's still important if we're using an adhered system, but uh, the point is vapor permeability makes a big difference in addition to all those air sealing details. The more you insulate, uh, the more you have to worry about this type of stuff. The next question is in regard to basements. The question is, there's a technique for insulating basements with house wrap on the concrete block side first, and then studs, bat insulation, and vapor barrier. What are your thoughts on this method? And simply put, we run into the same problem that we're concerned about with vapor barriers. Uh, installing house wrap does not prevent moisture from getting trapped in the wall assembly if you have that vapor barrier there. I would question what the purpose of the house wrap is in this situation. Are we using it as a capillary break? Okay, that might work, but at the end of the day, you're still gonna have moisture that's drying out of that foundation wall. And if that house wrap is vapor permeable, and if you have a vapor barrier, uh, you know, sheet of polyethylene on the interior side, that's gonna trap that moisture in the wall. Also, if you don't perfectly air seal that vapor barrier membrane, uh, you're gonna have air leakage into that cavity, which will result in condensation on the backside of that house wrap or on the concrete block wall. My preferred approach is just to install some taped rigid foam insulation against that block wall, and that way we're providing the benefits of a vapor retarder, a thermal break, an air barrier, and we're preventing all that warm, moisture-laden interior air from condensing on that cold block wall, and then we're allowing that stud cavity to dry back to the interior, so we're not gonna trap moisture and uh, the components that will see some moisture are inherently moisture resistant, so it doesn't matter at the end of the day. So if you can help it, don't install a vapor barrier in your basement wall assembly. And if you have to, by local jurisdictions or code or if your inspector is requiring it, install a smart vapor retarder instead. And that way you'll be able to still dry through that membrane, but it'll still provide the benefits of a traditional vapor retarder. The next question is also regarding vapor retarders. What is the cheapest vapor retarder you recommend? Do you believe the Sega Myrex hype with their variable based on seasons, wraps, or is any of these new type of materials good enough and thus I can go with the cheapest option? Just doing dense pack cellulose in a wall assembly that will be 10 inches thick. At that thickness, is the Myrex even needed? Also, if any is good, what is the best in the cheap area? So there's a few questions here, I think. A lot of these questions are in regard to what's the cheapest option in terms of vapor control. Let's address the first question. What is the cheapest vapor retarder that you recommend? And it really depends on the application in which you're using that vapor retarder. If we're just saying, you know, we're, we need a vapor retarder on our wall to uh, meet code, I would say a latex paint and primer is probably your best option. Um, that's the cheapest option and it has worked for many, many years um, in many uh, temperate climates. 
Let's address the next question here. Do you believe the Sega Myrex hype? Uh, and the answer is yes, they actually do work. Um, do you necessarily need them? And the answer is no if you're insulating properly. If you insulate on the exterior of your assembly with the right proportion of rigid insulation, you don't need a vapor retarder on the interior side of your walls because you're warming the condensing surface of the sheathing sufficiently to where any vapor flow from the interior is not a problem. Now, if you can't insulate on the exterior, whether you're dealing with a retrofit application or if the budget just doesn't allow for it, or if you have another complex building condition, then the Sega Myrex is a very, you know, a viable option that you can use. You know, what also works as a smart vapor retarder is taped plywood. It has the same characteristics as a smart vapor retarder because the smart vapor retarders were somewhat inspired by how wood functions. Wood increases in permeability and permeance as uh, it gets wetter. So uh, plywood, for example, it is around, I think, three perms a dry cup. So when it's dry, it's not letting too much moisture in and out. But when it gets wet, it can become up to, I believe, 20 perms or over 20 perms. So do the smart membranes work? Yes, they do. Um, if you want the cheapest option, you can use latex paint and primer. Latex paint and primer on gypsum board will not necessarily provide the benefits of an air barrier that uh, the smart vapor retarder can unless you're detailing that gypsum board to be airtight, uh, but that has a lot of problems in itself that I can address in another video. And finally, the other part of that question is, you're insulating with 10 inches of cellulose. At that thickness, is the Myrex even needed? And the answer is it really depends on the climate that you're building in. Uh, if you're building in a cold climate, yes, the Myrex is needed if you're not insulating on the exterior. Um, if you're building in a temperate climate, you might be able to get away with it. But the thing is that sheathing is going to be kept a lot colder, which means it's going to have a harder time drying out if it gets wet. And wood increases in moisture content with relative humidity. And when it's cold outside, relative humidity drops. And that means the moisture content of your wood components increases if they're cold. Hopefully that answers your question. This next question is in regard to air barriers and the vapor permeability of air barriers. Uh, the question is, I'm still confused, why not always use a vapor open air barrier? In essence, zip sheathing or something like around two perms, let moisture dry to the inside or the outside. Yeah, I mean, we try to uh, design assemblies so that they can dry in both directions whenever we can. However, a lot of the time we will have reservoir claddings, uh, which is a cladding material um, or finished material that absorbs and stores water. And so when the sun comes out and uh, hits the surface of that reservoir cladding, we get a lot of inward vapor drive. And so it's important to slow down that moisture flow into the cavity. Uh, otherwise, we can get condensation on the backside of the drywall, especially if that interior space is air conditioned. And so, you know, we, we don't want to allow too much vapor to pass through at once, um, but we don't want to restrict vapor necessarily from being able to dry to the interior or dry to the exterior. So. Um, you kind of have to be uh, Goldilocks in a way, and not too much, not too little, just right in a lot of assemblies. There are some assemblies where we do need to uh, completely restrict vapor flow. Um, uh, one assembly that comes to mind would be a flat roof assembly that uh, has a concrete roof deck where we have a lot of moisture trying to dry to the exterior. And if we don't have a very strong vapor retarder and air barrier installed over that concrete roof deck, uh, we can get moisture that gets trapped underneath the primary roof membrane. And then we get uh, deterioration, we get a loss of adhesion if we're using uh, water-based adhesives. Don't use water-based adhesives. Um, a lot of bad things can happen. So it really depends on the assembly that you're designing. A lot of the time we do want that building assembly to dry out um, in either direction if possible as a flow through assembly, but um, there are times when we need to slow down that moisture flow or stop it completely. I hope that answers your question. It's a little bit nuanced. Our final question is in regard to insulating a 124 year old farmhouse in Illinois. Uh, the question is I'm remodeling a 124 year old farmhouse in Illinois. What do I use for insulation? And it really depends on what your budget is, um, what your performance goals are for uh, that building and how much access you'll have to the exterior of 
that old farmhouse. If you're able to remove all of the siding and access the sheathing to inspect it, um, then I would recommend primarily first putting down a new high quality self-adhered or fluid applied weather resistive barrier so that you have a nice monolithic water and air control layer. And if possible, insulating on the exterior to make sure that you're providing a nice thermal break and eliminating any of the potential for condensation to occur on the backside of that sheathing. So it'll extend the service life of that building and the durability of all those wooden components. Now, this is a really generalized answer. If you're unable to access the exterior sheathing or remove the siding, you're gonna have a lot harder time actually insulating that old building. Um, there are strategies that you can use to insulate interstitially between the studs, but you know you really have to look at this stuff on a case-by-case -case basis, and I would highly, highly recommend uh, trying to address it from the exterior side if possible. Um, like I said, there is a way to retrofit insulation into a cavity space. Um, it's just when you get into those uh, much colder climates like in Illinois, where you have extremely cold winters, your condensation risk is much, much higher and the risk for deterioration is also much higher. So be very careful when it comes to insulating those really old farmhouses and buildings. That's all we have for today. If you like this more laid back Q&A format, let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. Also head over to siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.